Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Women's Health Podcast, A Woman's Journey, Insights That Matter. I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, and I invite you to listen to Johns Hopkins specialists discuss the latest topics in women's health. Now here's your host, Lily Shockney. Hi, this is Lily Shakti from A Woman's Journey at Johns Hopkins, and this is our podcast, Insights That Matter. In this podcast, I am joined by cardiac surgeon, Dr. James Gammy. He serves as surgical lead and co-director for the Johns Hopkins Heart and Vascular Institute and cardiac surgeon in chief for the Johns Hopkins Health System. His clinical and research efforts are focused on decreasing the mortality and morbidity of valve disease and improving the surgical treatment of mitral valve and other structural heart diseases. He performs over 225 mitral valve operations and interventions per year and leads a cardiac surgery team that performs more than 1,200 cardiac operations annually. Today, we're going to be talking about mitral valve disease. And according to the CDC, heart disease is the leading cause of death for men, women, and people of most racial and ethnic groups in the United States, which balances out to one person dying every 34 seconds in the U.S. And I want to emphasize that again, one person dying every 34 seconds. So just picture a bell going off every 34 seconds while we're having this discussion. And I think that really does resonate with people to understand that we need to pay a whole lot more attention to our heart and make it a priority, or we may not be here. One cause of heart disease is the topic today of valvular heart disease. So welcome, Dr. Gammy, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Lily. It's a pleasure to be here. I think we want to start with educating our audience. What is mitral valve disease? Let me pan out for one second. The Heart has four valves that assure that blood flow is in the correct direction. One of the most important valves is called the mitral valve. It's actually named after, if you look at uh, bishops, they have a hat called a mitre hat, M-I-T-R-E. That's how the mitral valve got its name. And it is a one-way valve in the heart that is the entrance valve into the main pumping chamber of the heart. The mitral valve opens and closes at the same rate that your heart beats, and it assures that blood can enter the main pumping chamber as the heart is relaxing, and then as the heart squeezes, the valve closes. It's made up of two flaps, or what we call leaflets, and it's kind of like a double door. The mitral valve opens and closes two to three billion times in a person's life, remarkably goes bad in only a small percentage of us. That's incredible. Thinking about the frequency is far more than I ever would have calculated. How many jelly beans are in that big jar? I don't do that very well either. (laughs) When a baby is born, is there a way to be able to tell right from birth that someone has mitral valve disease? Mitral valve disease is extraordinarily uncommon in newborns. It's more a disease of the elderly, a middle-aged and elderly, I would say. And there's two things that can go wrong with the mitral valve. The most common one is that it leaks. The other problem that can occur with the mitral valve is that it becomes narrowed and becomes obstructive to blood flow passing through the valve. Are there different forms of mitral valve disease? There are. The most common type is what we call degenerative mitral valve disease, which is where the valve leaks. And let me get a little bit more involved here in terms of the structure of the valve. It's a wonderful, masterful structure. And it's, uh, as I mentioned, there's two leaflets and each one is uh, supported by about uh, 15 or 16 small cords. And it's almost, imagine you had two parachutes that were open right next to each other. That's what the valve looks like. As we age, those cords that support the valve and the the two flaps as the heart squeezes, the two flaps come together and prevent any backflow of blood. And what can happen as we get older is that those cords that support the two leaflets can either elongate or rupture. And so one of those leaflets can come up above where it should be positioned and allow a large leak. Imagine a double door in a fancy house and one of those doors opened more than it should. And that's what causes a leakage of the mitral valve, what we call mitral regurgitation. There's another name
name for that you've probably heard called mitral valve prolapse. And that means when one of those leaflets extends further north than it should, and that leads to leakage. There are other causes of mitral valve disease as well. The most common one worldwide is rheumatic heart valve disease. And this is the reason that when you're growing up, your mom or dad gives you amoxicillin when you have strep throat. A group A strep infection is generally something that the body manages okay. But what happens is that group A strep, the immune system attacks the strep and it turns out that the epitopes or the surface of the mitral valve looks exactly like a group A strep. And uh -huh. over the subsequent decades, your immune system slowly attacks your own heart valve and it causes it to become scarred and immobile. And this is a huge problem. It relates to hygiene and income and all those types of things and the closeness of people. It's a huge problem in the developing world, but it remains a problem here in the United States. So that's a common problem. There are other causes as well. There's something that we call secondary mitral regurgitation or leakage of the valve. And in that case, the valve's normal, but the heart becomes abnormal normal. So I tell patients that their heart grows from the size, a normal orange size to a grapefruit size. And when that happens, that it so happens that the valve and those cords that I mentioned are attached to the inside of the heart. The two flaps are pulled apart and they can't come together properly. And that's a relatively common problem as well. And then there are a variety of other things. Sometimes the valve gets a lot of calcium on it, doesn't move properly. That's called calcific mitral valve disease. The valve can become infected and with a bacterial infection called endocarditis. As a mitral valve surgeon, those are some of the most common diseases and abnormalities of the valve that we would see. Is this more common in men than in women? And is there a difference as to how this disease behaves if you're a man or a woman? That's a terrific question. And the answer is yes. The disease that I just mentioned, rheumatic mitral valve disease, is far more common in women. About 80% of people worldwide that have that are women. The other disease process that I mentioned, the thing that I treat the most, degenerative mitral regurgitation, is more common in women when we do population-based studies. Yet remarkably, men present for surgery substantially more often than women. And we still don't really know what the reason is for that. There are other issues with comparing men versus women with mitral valve disease. Women have slightly higher risk with uh, surgery. And the calcific, where calcium gets deposit on the valve is remarkably more common in older women. So those are all things that as a practicing surgeon that we see. And finally, we need to do a little bit better job in clinical trials that we run. One big clinical trial that we were involved in called the COAP trial only enrolled about a third of the population were women. And so women are consistently underrepresented in clinical trials of valve disease. So there's uh, opportunities to learn more there and to perhaps do better. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the calcium buildup because a lot of our listeners are going to be women many of them are taking like calcium citrate to prevent osteopenia and osteoporosis. Does calcium intake, whether it be in food form or pill form, influence the buildup of calcium on the valve? Great question. And one we get asked frequently, the simple answer is no, absolutely not. And so- That's good. That's a yeah. good answer. Because yeah. <laughs> we don't want to be trying to fix one thing and then break something else. That certainly would not be very helpful. So if someone was trying to figure out, am I at risk for getting mitral valve disease? What kind of risk factors within an individual and within a family might you be looking for? You bring up a good question. It's largely a sporadic problem. The most common thing that I operate on, including today, is the degenerative mitral valve regurgitation. And while there have been a few genes identified with some cases, by and large, it is a sporadic problem. I will tell you, we do know that there is a familial tendency for mitral valve disease. And I would say about one out of 10 patients or two out of 10 patients that come to my office with mitral valve disease will tell me that, oh, my dad or my uncle sometimes both had a mitral valve operation or have mitral valve disease. But by and large, it's sporadic. The biggest risk factor really is age. And as we get older, young people have a very low risk of having significant mitral disease, mitral regurgitation. As you get up to be 75 or above, 
the prevalence of moderate or severe disease in the population is somewhere around 7 or 8%. So it does become more common as we get older. There's not really much you can do to decrease the risk of having a significant heart valve problem, particularly mitral valve disease. What kind of symptoms might an individual experience that would alert them, gee, I might have something going on here and I better see somebody? The cardinal symptom of mitral valve disease is shortness of breath. That is the most common phenomenon. And uh, typically, say, for example, a patient has a leaky mitral valve. What that means is that every time the heart squeezes, about 50% of the blood in the heart gets ejected backwards instead of going forward. And when it goes backwards, it gets ejected into the low pressure blood vessels in the lungs, what's called the left atrium. And that gives us a subjective feeling of shortness of breath. So that's a very common presentation. When that blood gets ejected backwards, that left atrium, the chamber above the valve, it's like a thin-walled muscular balloon and it stretches. And sometimes that can cause an irregular heart rhythm, which you've probably heard of called atrial fibrillation. And I would say about 20% of the patients that come to my operating room have atrial fibrillation caused by the leaky mitral valve. So those are the most common symptoms. It's remarkable nowadays, there's been a sort of a sea change in how we and when we treat mitral valve disease surgically. And a lot of patients are coming to us without symptoms at all. Their primary care physician is astute and they listen with a stethoscope. A lot of physicians are not poo-poo the value of a physical exam, but I can tell you that one thing, when your doc puts a stethoscope on your chest and they hear whoosh, 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 and they send you to a cardiologist and they show that you have a severe leak of the mitral valve, that is a very valuable intervention. And so we see probably 40 or more percent of the patients in my office don't have symptoms. And yet they have such severe regurgitation that we generally wind up operating on them early because the results of surgery are so good. And we also know that after a high quality mitral valve operation, when we can fix that valve, that those patients will have a normal lifespan. So it's super important to detect it early. And we as a community of cardiologists and cardiac surgeons think that it's important to manage and to get rid of that leakage early on rather than wait until there are changes in the heart and the lungs and the blood vessels in the lungs where we can still fix it, but that the outcomes in the long term will not be as good. And you're talking about who gets operated on between men and women. I think that women are very talented at getting their spouses to their PCP. They're not very talented at getting themselves to their PCP. So the good listening ears of a PCP, I can see would be the discoverer, if you will, of that whoosh sound. With the shortness of breath, is this shortness of breath on exertion or just shortness of breath in general, just getting up and walking across the room? Great question. It, it tends to start with exertion and then over it's like time. going up a flight of steps or carrying something. That's exactly right. And that's always the question that we ask. That's important to know and to also understand. From a surgical perspective, how long is a patient in the hospital? Let me back up a second and share with you what we think about as surgeons with mitral valve disease. And as I mentioned, the most common problem is the leakage with degenerative disease. And when it becomes severe, we generally recommend an operation. And every patient is, of course, individualized. There are two options when we operate on a patient. One, we can replace the valve with an artificial valve, or we can repair the existing valve and restore it to a functional status. There is no perfect replacement. There is no perfect replacement valve. The two types of replacement valve, the general types that we have, one is what's called a tissue valve or an animal-based valve. In my operating room, we use a cow valve. You may have also heard of pig valves. We use cow valves. And the other alternative is a metal mechanical valve, which is made up of two metal flaps that open and close. Both of those valves, although they're easy to sew in and it's a, a fairly straightforward operation to do, they both have downsides. The metal valve requires that the patient takes a blood thinner called Coumadin for life, which has a risk of bleeding and other things that your listeners probably know about. And the cow valve, while it doesn't require a blood thinner, it typically wears out in the mitral position after 12 or 15 years. Oh. And we're looking at either another operation or another procedure. Back in the 1980s, we were taught by a 
French surgeon named Alain Carpentier how to repair the valve. And that's what we do nowadays. And typically, my approach to fixing the valve, where we have one of the leaflets that's not supported properly, what we do is we put in artificial cords that pull that flap down where it belongs. And those cords are made out of Gore-Tex. After we put those Gore-Tex cords in, that pulls the flap down where it belongs. And then we sew a cloth covered metal ring around the perimeter of the valve to narrow the opening and stabilize the repair. So that's a mitral valve repair. And that is a fantastic operation because you don't have to take a blood thinner. And while it's not perfect, it has a lifetime guarantee of about 90 to 95%. So very few people need anything else done. And after a successful mitral valve repair, and this is really the only operation in cardiac surgery where we can say this, your survival, as I mentioned earlier, is the same as a woman or man your age with no heart disease at all. So we really like to repair the valve if at all possible. And I'll just say that it is an art, mitral valve repair, and it really matters who your surgeon is doing this. And we've published papers on this. It turns out that the average heart surgeon in the United States does about five mitral valve operations a year. And it turns out that you need to be doing about 40 to 50 to have a reliably high repair rate. In our shop, for example, I have a specialized practice, which I think is the way to go. They say that 80% of mitral valve operations are done by 20% of heart surgeons in the United States. So we do 250 to 300 a year at Hopkins. It's important to have someone fixing your valve who has a ton of experience. There's what we call a volume outcome relationship. So that's extremely important. We've seen the same with other specialties as well. And I work in the breast cancer arena. And even for breast surgical oncologists, the more they do, the higher the survival rate, even when we're just looking from a surgical perspective for surgical management. You definitely don't want the jack of all trades, master of none, because you got one heart, right? <laughs> uh, and we're not here to talk about heart transplant today, but I certainly can imagine that individuals that don't have the right skill set and have mastered it. And this is what you live and breathe. Now, I won't have you do a hernia repair on me because that would not be probably your best operation, but there truly is benefit. And we know that. And so for our audience, I want to remind you that before you are selecting someone to be doing this type of procedure, you need to know the numbers. You need to know, is this what they live and breathe? Is this their specialty? How long has this been their specialty? How many do they do a year? And what's their success rate? How are these patients doing from a clinical outcomes perspective for sure? If someone were having a, an EKG done just as a routine, maybe annual, or maybe they're going to have a hernia repair and they're 65 years old. And as part of that anesthesia evaluation, they need to get an EKG. Would you see on the EKG gee, this person probably has a mitral valve problem? Generally, no. If there was atrial fibrillation, then that would lead to an investigation. The study that is crucial for heart valve disease and mitral valve disease in particular is an ultrasound of the heart, what we call an echocardiogram. And the quality of echocardiograms are remarkable today. And we can see exactly what's wrong with the valve. We can quantitate how much it leaks, whether it's narrow, how it's affected the heart function, all of those kind of things. So that's the way to go. If I may back up just for a second, when you were talking to your listeners, as you think about where to be treated with this. It's not really just the surgeon, it's really the team. And valve disease has a fancy new name these days called structural heart disease. That's because the interventional cardiologists have gotten involved. And we at Hopkins, I think, are an example of a large multidisciplinary program where we have all kinds of great people that can help you with mitral valve disease. And the treatment of this problem is not just limited to surgery. Thank goodness. There are many patients who benefit substantially from medication. We have heart failure specialists who we can send you to. And we also have both investigational and FDA approved therapies where we can treat the mitral valve with a catheter, with a thin tube, without surgery. So that's very, very exciting. And I think that having all those bright folks working together to come up with the best treatment plan for an individual patient is definitely the way to go. And so I think going to a place that has that multidisciplinary team is essential. 
and uh, well-oiled machine of a multidisciplinary team, which I know that we certainly do take pride in at Hopkins. I want to hear more about the catheter because I believe you're being shy and telling us that you're the inventor of a novel transeptal catheter. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, our laboratory is, we're interested in innovations in heart valve disease, treating heart valve disease. And I've yet to find a patient, well, in general, patients really do not want to have open heart surgery. It's fun for us to do. They don't want to have it unless they're sleeping upright every night and can barely breathe and know that they're on the brink of death. So I think one of the real areas of opportunity is uh, less invasive approaches. And I'm a serial inventor and our team, our laboratory has developed a number of things. For example, I mentioned that one of the treatments is a catheter-based treatment. It's called a TIR, transcatheter edge-to-edge repair. And it involves putting, I mentioned those two flaps, it involves putting a cloth-covered metal clip and attaching the middle of those two flaps together. So it becomes a double orifice, a double opening repair, sort of a shotgun repair. This was developed actually by an Italian surgeon who's a friend and colleague named Ottavio Alfieri. The catheter-based approach, one of the people who holds a foundational patented on it is somebody that your listeners will know named Mehmet Oz. And Dr. Oz, back in the day when he was a young up-and-coming academic surgeon, was involved in this. Anyhow, transcatheter edge-to-edge repairs have been done over 50,000 times in the United States. We do them as well as the interventional cardiologists. And the first step is from going from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. And right now, when I started doing this, that part of the operation is called a transeptal puncture. And it's done with basically a long curved coat hanger. And it's really crude and I thought a little bit frightening. I mean, obviously it's a little bit more than that. Hasn't changed much since it was invented by a Hopkins surgical resident around 1960. And so we came up with a new catheter that's highly maneuverable and that we believe will make this a lot safer. And we're commercializing that and we've had really great results and we hope to be in humans in the next year or so. So that's one thing that we think will make these procedures safer, faster, easier to learn and more widely applicable. So that's just one example of something that we've looked at. Will it be named the GAMI catheter? No, I have no, we have no interest in that. The company is called Proterix. uh, uh, No, no, not at all. Um, It it was a a team effort, but it's pretty slick. And I'm really looking forward to seeing it in patients. For me, I can only operate on so many people in my lifetime, but if we develop something that's really impactful, that, uh, you know, ramifies out in a nice way. So in several cases, you've mentioned metal, including, you know, a new metal valve in some cases. Does that become a problem if you're getting on an airplane? Does it go off when they walk through the scanner? Nope. No. Oh, that's good. Because I know people that have the, I'm going to say the older versions of hip replacements still have to carry a card in their wallet and all that stuff to explain why the machine is squealing at them. What is the age of the youngest patient you've ever operated on for this condition? As I mentioned, pediatric heart surgeons will occasionally see patients with mitral valve disease, and I will typically partner with one of my congenital partners on those cases. My experience with reconstructive techniques can sometimes be additive. I do remember the smallest patient we ever did a heart operation on was 800 grams. That was in my training. And I remember we had a nurse who had a great sense of humor. And after we were finished, she got on the uh, intercom and she says, all kinds of lifting help needed in room nine. Uh, Oh my goodness. That's a tiny patient. Sure is. um, For sure. Is there other research also going on? And let's talk about clinical trials in regards to research, because you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that we need more participation in clinical trials and better representation, more representation as well. Are there clinical trials that you could talk a little bit more about? Are they related to certain medications or are they related to catheters or something else? All of the above. And at Hopkins, we're huge fans of clinical research, we believe that we don't want to be doing things the way we do them now 10 years from now. We want to be better at what we do. And we have a extremely talented team here, a clinical research team, ably led by a colleague of mine named Lisa Fornaracio, Dr. Fornaracio. 
we're part of a network sponsored by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute called the Cardiothoracic Surgery Trials Network. And it is a very important network. And we've carried out a number of what your listeners probably know are the gold standard for evidence generation, which is a prospective randomized controlled trial. I'll give you one or two examples of trials. The tricuspid valve is on the other side of the heart, and it often leaks a moderate amount when we have a leaky mitral valve, and we weren't sure whether we should fix it in that situation. And so we took 400 patients and flipped a coin, and 200 of them, we would fix the tricuspid valve, and the other 200, we didn't. And we got very, very valuable information that I think has changed practice as a result. The network now has active trials going on. One of the trials is for patients over 65 to compare conventional surgery surgical repair with the transcatheter edge-to-edge repair, actually. We have a number of other randomized trials. There are trials going on at Hopkins for a catheter-based valve replacement in the tricuspid position. And so that's actively enrolling patients. We have a number of trials. So we always want to be learning more. I will say there aren't many or any drug trials for valve disease. Valve disease is a, it's really a mechanical problem that requires a mechanical solution. But within the context of valve disease, there's a lot of different trials ongoing. That's great. That's really wonderful. Two things popped in my head in listening to you talk about this with the blood going in the wrong direction. And I recently watched over the holidays, the movie Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, where uh, the people in one car is shouting over to uh, John Candy saying, you're going the wrong way. (laughs) So I can see how the leakiness would certainly cause that. Maybe you'd have a t-shirt made that says, we now have everything going the right way once again. This is fascinating what you're educating us about I also wonder, I know with cancer, there was research done in Sweden about 20 years ago where they took 10,000 people who had died from heart disease, car accidents, anything other than cancer, and they had no history of cancer, and they did autopsies on them. And they found that over 50% had a life-threatening cancer in their body that had never been diagnosed. I'm wondering... How many people do you think are probably walking around with this, particularly as we're looking at health disparities, have no idea and may even die and still not know that that was the culprit all along? Well, I don't want to frighten folks. As I mentioned, it's a disease of aging. And by the time you get to be 80, there's probably a one in 10 chance that you have a moderate amount of disease or severe. And moderate, we probably wouldn't treat. So, you know, and overall, the I mentioned mitral valve prolapse, it affects approximately two to 3% of the population, but the large majority of those people never require an operation or an intervention. So otherwise we would be so busy, we wouldn't know what to do. I think I would just encourage folks, it's not something I'd lie awake worrying about at night, but I do think that seeing a primary care physician on a regular basis is something worthwhile uh, doing. And I agree. And I think that people have lost sight of the value of doing the wellness examination annually, that they primarily go to their PCP for back pain, cold or flu, or a rash. Those are the three things that have been studied as to why you go see your PCP. I'm sure that we can inspire our listeners to say, you know, a really good reason is for that doctor to listen to my heart and make sure that everything sounds the way we need it to sound for sure. Thank you ever so much, Dr. Gammy, for joining us today. I appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule so that we're going to be brighter. Maybe we can be on Jeopardy and they'll have a column on there. This is mitral valve disease and you have provided us all of the answers. We hope you will join us next month for another educational and informative podcast featuring another Johns Hopkins medicine expert. And in the meantime, I invite you to visit the A Woman's Journey website at hopkinsmedicine.org forward slash a woman's journey to sign up for our monthly e-letter, read about upcoming podcasts and programs, and to sign up for our upcoming free Conversations That Matter webcasts. And again, Dr. Gammy, thank you for joining me today. Lily, it was a pleasure. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Thank you for listening to A Woman's Journey podcast. Join me, Kelly Gear Ripkin, your host, Lily Shockney, and a variety of Johns Hopkins experts on the first Thursday of each month to learn about medical advances in women's health. A Woman's Journey is grateful for the unrestricted educational grants 
from HRH Foundation that supports our podcast series, Insights That Matter. For more information about A Woman's Journey's virtual programs occurring throughout the year and our monthly webcasts and podcasts, visit our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Like us on Facebook and Twitter and visit our website at hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Until next time, stay well.